evening. Thank you, Chairman Castle, trustees, President Kerwin, and thank you, President Kerwin, for all your years of service at this amazing university. President-elect Burwell, my friend, Provost Bass, Dean Starr, family, friends, alumni, faculty members, and our amazing student speaker, and quite especially our 2017 graduates. I am both honored and delighted to be here and receive this degree from American University. Graduates, congratulations. I am impressed at your track record. You are a class of global leaders prepared to confront some of the greatest issues we face around the world. But today, I want to ask you to join me in confronting a great issue we face right here at home. As you heard, I lead Martha's Table, an organization that believes that every child deserves their greatest opportunity and a family and community deeply devoted to their success. Today, I'm asking you to use your education, your access, your future career to lead in the effort to create wherever you land, a community deeply devoted to evening the odds of success for every child. So let's, so let's start here, where you spent the last four years. This neighborhood, as you must realize, is predominantly white. The children here have great odds. The median income for a family in this ward is a whopping $200,000 a year, and less than 3% of the children live in poverty. The public schools and the charter schools have great results. But drive with me just 10 miles across the Anacostia River, where Martha's Table is building its new headquarters, where one quarter of all DC residents live, and there, the majority of our neighbors are African American, and those rosy numbers are turned on their head. $32,000 a year is the median family income. A full 50% of children, one in two, look to your left and look to your right, one in two children will grow up in greatest poverty. And all of the children are living in neighborhoods deeply affected by that poverty, with far too few resources and far too many failing schools, and far too much stress of every kind. To really even the odds for all children, we need to advance not just education and econ economic opportunity, we must advance racial equity, which is... Racial equity is simply defined as the state where your race has no predictive value on your likely access to quality goods, quality services, and life outcomes. Well, guess what? DC fails that test, as does almost every community in America. Race in 2017 America is still a huge predictor of a child's chances. So if you will take on this challenge with me, you must first reflect as I have. What got me here today, and what did I benefit from? I grew up in a middle-class Irish Catholic family, the sixth of nine children. I dropped out of college after running up a large debt and got married very quickly, had kids, and began to focus on making the money needed to raise my family. Just like families I work with every day at Martha's Table, I wanted the best for my children, so I returned to school with my first child in tow and cobbled together enough credits to get my degree from the local state university extension. But the world was changing. When I was your age, in 1977, an 8-bit computer was released, the Apple II. And it turned out I had the knack, not just for using these computers, but for explaining how to use this technology to others. And then the phone rang at my desk in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I had an opportunity to move my family across the country to a little startup called Microsoft. And that changed just about everything. I was in the right place at the right time with a passion for the progress microcomputing could bring to so many things. But what I was far less aware of was I also had a hugely important head start, the privilege of growing up white in America. I could sit in a meeting at Microsoft filled with male MIT and Stanford grads, and despite my lack of world-class qualifications, my colleagues judged me solely on my work, 
rather than on what they assumed about my education or assumed based on my skin color. Okay, as a woman in technology in the 80s, I did have to listen to far more than my fair share of mansplaining. <laughs> but looking back, looking back, I blush to realize that even though I made it to that seat, that was not the case for equally competent leaders of color. They were not at the table, they are still not at the table. There were only nine Latino and five African American CEOs of Fortune 500 companies today. Why is this? And why was I, a woman acutely aware of my own minority status in technology, not more concerned about the other missing folks at the table? Because I, like many of you parents, students, and even faculty, was far more aware of the barriers I faced than the benefits I was building on. I was thinking of the many obstacles I had to overcome instead of realizing that my skin color, my upbringing in middle America, my own children being in schools that were excellent and neighborhoods that were safe, allowed me to slip in and yes, blend in to that seat, to that group, in a way that equally deserving leaders of color could not. Yet I was raised in a highly activist family. I cared a lot about justice and fairness. And if I saw injustice, be it hunger on the streets or blatant racism of any kind, I was quick to fight and quick to protest. But today I realize this. I was passive in the face of missing justice, passive in the need to recognize the role of race in shaping and steering the very institutions that I was benefiting from. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said, in the end we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I'm afraid that I was often that silent friend, not out of malice, but out of self-absorption with my own journey and my own story, out of failure to be awake to the injustice that subtly but continually benefited me on my path to success while holding back others on their own journey. So fast forward a decade and I left Microsoft and became the founding CEO of the Gates Foundation, working alongside Bill Gates Sr. and with the amazing and soon to be 14th president of American University. Our mission statement reflected our shared commitment to justice. Everyone should have the opportunity for a healthy and productive life. So I had 13 exciting years moving from st that starting that mission to bold action, identifying injustice around the world and creating partnerships to tackle it, whether that was new research and development for diseases, fixing failed markets for child-saving vaccines, bolstering HIV AIDS prevention. But as I retired from the foundation, I began the process of inventorying. What had we accomplished? And what had we missed? I reveled in the successes, millions of lives saved, building new solutions to old problems. But I came face to face with a very old problem we had not made a dent in, persistent child poverty in America. It hadn't changed one bit in those 13 years. My head hurt and my heart hurt that around the world we could tally amazing results for increased justice, but here at home, the gains were so few. I could not understand it, and I could not stand it. But once I accepted it, I had to learn more. What was it that we, not just Gates, but all of us, were missing? Thus began a new journey that led me to Martha's table, that led me to stand here in front of you and talk about the hardest subject I have ever studied, the hardest lesson I have ever learned, my own ignorance of the deeply rooted and often invisible role of race in America, of how racism is not only about those cowardly, hateful gestures that shock us and demand our condemnation, whether we see them on Facebook or here on our campus, but about the majority of deeply damaging racial bias in this country that is not practiced by those few who actively hate, but by our most powerful and most influential institutions that shape opportunity in this country every day and by those of us who stand silently by. I'm talking. Thank you. 
I am speaking of the bias and racism that quietly but efficiently wound itself into the very foundations that built our neighborhoods, where your race is more a predictor than your income, which street you will live on. Built our education institutions, where the demographics of your community predicts the quality of your schools. That built our public agencies with impossible or humiliating hurdles to access critical benefits. And yes, built the nonprofits and corporations that perpetuate privilege in deep patterns of recruiting, promotion, and allocation of power. A system where the one thing I have in common with the 37 years of the prior well-meaning CEOs of Martha's Table is the color of my skin. Yes, we recoil at the videos of African American males being victims of police brutality, and we question whether justice on our streets is being metered fairly, but the statistics are far more damaging than any video can capture. Consider the consequences of smoking pot. Whites and blacks use marijuana at roughly equal rates but African Americans are nearly four times as likely to be arrested for it. Four times as likely. Just think of the family and societal and community consequences of that inequity, but I am afraid the list of inequities is very long. Graduates, I join so many of the parents and faculty here in being grateful for the awareness you already bring to this issue. You are more aware than any who came before you. You're in the right place at the right time. With your leadership, we can move from awareness to lasting change, change that will come individually and collectively when we examine how race has affected every aspect of our American life and our American institutions. And with honest dialogue and considerable bravely, bravery and action, we can work together in those institutions to root it out. If you are white like me, Join me in thoughtful study. Acknowledge the privilege bestowed upon you by no effort and no fault of your own. And no matter your skin color, as you work to decide on your best town, your best employer, your best grad school, your best career, take the time to decide how you will work for racial justice in all of those settings. And please, don't wake like I did. Start now so that when one of you leads this commencement in 20 years, Race will not be a significant predictor of any child's access to quality education, healthy food, or likelihood of success. I want, I want to congratulate you and thank you one more time. You leave here today with a well-deserved degree and a responsibility on your shoulders. Let me repeat what Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. told us. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. My friends, I urge you, as you build your exciting future, stay awake, stay aware, and break the silence. <laughs>